Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. All right, let's get started. So conservation of charge, we talked about this yesterday, albeit very briefly. We're gonna go over it again. So when you have a charged object, for example, a negatively charged rod, if you come into contact with, let's say a neutral object, the charge, you're gonna share charges. Right, they're going to share charges. And what's going to happen is that the charge is going to be shared between both of these objects. Right? So they both have now have a charge of negative 2e each. And that's the... And they must have the same charge. They must. You cannot have a charge of uh, negative 1e and this can be negative three, that's not possible. They, mu they both must have the same exact charge. Now you guys might think that you must have the same amount of electrons. And that's a misconception students have. It is not, the goal is not to have the same amount of electrons. The goal is that when objects interact with one another, when they make contact, they share charges. They must have the same charge. For example, this object right here has four protons. And this one right here has five protons and five electrons. Now this, now that they've made contact, what happens is that two electrons transfer over. And so now this bar will have four protons and two electrons. And this one right here will have five protons and three electrons. And how many electrons you have don't matter. Only the charge matters. They must have the same charge. They both have two more protons than electrons, right? This is both positive 2e and this is also positive 2e. You have two more protons than electrons in both situations. And so that is the goal. The goal is to have the same charge. The goal is not to have the same electrons. The goal is to have the same charge. Now let's do a practice problem, right? Because we need to be able to do a practice problem to actually figure out what the hell we're doing. Now, there are two ways to do this. There are two ways to do this. The first way is to do this through diagrams. The second way is to do it through math. Now the math, math method is much easier. It might not seem like it, but it will be. The math method is like two steps. While the diagram method is convoluted. The diagram method is convoluted. It's, it's not good for beginners but we're gonna do it the hard way first, okay? We're gonna do it the hard way first. What is positive 4e mean? What does positive 4e mean? They probably gain four electrons. Not exactly. What is the, what is, so if your charge is, and this is charged by the way, guys, this is Q1, this is charge one. So what is, 
Well, let's first dissect it. What does E mean? It's not mu electrons. What does E mean? Elementary charge. Yeah. E means elementary charge. It's protons, yeah. It's protons. E means elementary charge. Four means you have four of them. And the positive means they are protons, okay? E means you have elementary charges. Four means you have four of them. And the positive means that those elementary charges are protons. So you have four more protons than electrons. And that's a very important distinction. I wouldn't say I have four protons. I would say I have four more protons than electrons. Because you don't know how many more. How, you don't, I mean, you don't know how many electrons you have. You just know how many more of something you have. So in this case, you have four more protons than electrons. What about this side? What does is, what is negative 60 mean? Yeah, the negative means electrons. And since it says six, you have six of them. The E means elementary charge. So again, you have six electrons. You have six electrons. Now here's the tricky part with diagrams, right? This is the convoluted part. I, I really don't like diagrams, but I, I cover it anyway, because then you realize how much easier it is if you just do it using math. So let's do it the convoluted way. The goal here is to get the same charge. The goal here is to get the same charge. So if you're going to combine this all together, right, this is one entire object. And then this object is like you have four of these. And then you have six of these, right? And that's the entire combined object. And then you want to split it. You're splitting it now, which means that Huh, I don't like this. Mm. That's the convoluted part. Even I'm getting confused. I mean, it works like that, but fine. So let, let, let's start by this. Let's start this way. Let's first say we're going to transfer three electrons over. So we're moving three electrons to the other side. All right. So. So now we have three electrons on the opposite object. So what's the charge of this object now? I have four protons, three electrons on the other side now. What's my charge? Positive one, yeah, plus one. You have one more proton than electron. So you have positive one E. So that's charge, that's charge one. What about the other side? What's charge two? I have three electrons here. Oh, please. The goal is to have, okay, so the question, whoever asked me privately, so the goal is to have the same, the same charge. This is way until, let me see, let's see if I answer your question when I get to the end. Negative three, yeah, that's correct. You have negative three E, the charge is negative three E.
But that doesn't seem right. Again, the goal is to have the same charge. This doesn't seem right. Our, our charges are different. So this can't be right. This is, can't be right. This can't be right. Let's say I move uh, one more electron over, right? I'm gonna move one electron over now. What's the charge of object one? What's Q1? Zero, I have four protons, I have four electrons, I'm neutral. What about the right one? Negative two E, correct, because you have two electrons. But again, this is not the right answer. The goal is to have the same charge. This doesn't seem like we have the same charge. So we can't, this is not the right answer. Let's move one more electron over. What's my charge now of Q1? What's Q1 now? It's not negative two. Negative two would imply you have two more electrons than protons. Yeah, it's negative one. You have one more electron than protons. What about charge two? Also negative one, E. So now you've arrived at your answer. So the answer would be a charge of negative one E. And so this would be your answer. Uh, this is a convoluted way. Again, like I said before, this is a convoluted method. Uh, I don't really like it. It's confusing because for students that are just learning it you're like well how many electrons do I move over like what do I do but it's good to, if you can visualize it this way I would definitely if you can visualize this visualize it and you understand the top I'm not going to make you do that I'm going to teach you the easy way which pretty much everyone, everyone does it this way anyway. What you're going to do first is you're going to add both Q1 and Q2. And because I'm too lazy to switch colors, I'm just going to color both of them red. So the total charge, Q total, this is a Q, by the way, guys, this is a Q total, is Q1 plus Q2 plus 4e minus 6e, and you get negative 2e. So the total charge is negative 2e. That's a total charge when you add both objects and you place them together. Then you separate them which means you must separate the charges, which means that in the end, you have to do negative two divided by two because there are two objects and you get negative one E. And so the charges of both of these objects is now negative one E. And that's your answer. This is a much easier method. The math method is much easier, right? Because you're basically, why did I divide it by two? Because I'm separating the charge. This was the charge of one object, right? I'm, I'm placing the objects together, which means that the total charge is a certain number. But then you're splitting the objects, right? You're splitting the objects back up which means you have to divide that number by two because the charge is split between both of these objects.
Did you get it? Do you understand? I don't really see a response. You can't write for number, you can't draw for number seven anyway. So you have to write it. I mean, it, it's really simple to write it. It's just like, it's like you add both numbers and then you divide it by two. It's basically doing averages. If it was three objects, which you will never encounter, right? If you had three objects together, you would add all three and then you would divide by three. So the definition is that you add the numbers and then divide by two? Yes, that's okay. basically it. That's essentially it. Like, if you want to get the questions correct, that's all you need to do. And knowing that, see if you guys- Wait, 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 wait. What do you, what do you need to do again to get, to get the question right? You take the average. Okay. But the answer to number seven is not like describing what you do. Just give me the answer for number seven. Anyway, guys, do number eight. I, I want to see if you guys can apply what you just learned from number seven to number eight. If you can't, that's fine. I'm going to go over it nonetheless. But I want to see if you guys can do number eight yourselves. All right, so go ahead and attempt number eight. Actually, there is a, I don't want you. So in number eight, there are two questions. You can ignore the second question. All right, you can basically ignore this. Just ignore the second question. <gasps> okay. I mean, uh, from the six people, hopefully you guys are doing this on paper too, right? I think most of you are. So most of you got the beginning part down, so I, I might as well just write it, right? So most of you got the beginning part down where you have two spheres, right? And so this, this would be Q1 and sphere one would be uh, that charge, and then you have Q2, this would be that. And then you have Q total. And this is where most of you got up to, right? Most of you got up to the Q total part. I see one correct answer. Okay, I mean, I, I'm giving you enough time. Let's go over it, see what you guys got. Anyone, what I do here? 
So what's my total charge? Sir, for some reason, I can't submit the picture to the document. Um, uh, what is the error? I don't know. Like when I take when I take the picture of it, and I try like and I try like um, I just put it on the document itself. It just doesn't load in. Uh. And if I try writing it, if I try writing it, I don't have my pen on me, so um, I can't like write it fine like you're writing it right now. But I'm gonna try to submit it to a different a different um. It's page. fine. Oh, mark you. It's fine. I'm good. I understand your predicament. It's fine. As long as you have it somewhere, that's the most important. Part. No, no, no. I can use I instead of like instead of taking a picture, I can just use the text feature and just write the numbers down and everything. Okay. I mean, the important part is whether or not you know how to solve it because. That's the thing. The important part is that you're trying, right? I got like the first part, but like the rest of the part, so I was just lost on that part. So how are we doing, guys? We got up to the total charge part where you combine the objects together and then you have to separate the charges. So after you separate the charges, what is the charge? What do we do here? If the total charge is negative 12 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, what is the charge of each individual sphere after you separate them? Give me some hope, guys. Uh, you're wrong, person who messaged me privately, just based on the fact of one thing. This one thing you're missing. Yeah. Yeah, it's negative six. So basically what you're doing here, guys, is you're dividing the total number, right? Since the total charge combined is negative 12 times 10 to negative six coulombs. Well, if you were to split these two objects, you have to divide it by two because you're splitting them. So what it becomes is it becomes a negative, negative six times 10 to the negative six column. So Q1 is negative six times 10 to the negative six coulombs. Q2 Q2 is negative six times 10 to negative six coulombs. Wait, you got one point, negative 1 1.2 times 10 to negative five? That would be the same thing. That would be the same thing. Because negative 12 times 10 to negative six, if you move the decimal place over, that's, I'm sorry. If you move the decimal place over to the left, that becomes negative 1.2 times 10 to the negative five. Then you divide it by two, you get 0 0.6 times 10 to the negative five. If you move the decimal place back over, you get six times 10 to the negative six. Like that's what you would get as you plug it into a calculator. That's why you got that number. That's why. Are there questions about this, but guys, by the way, it's essentially you, you add up your numbers and then divide it by two. That's only if there were two spheres. We only deal with two objects anyway. We don't really deal with more objects uh, in our class. If it was three objects, you would divide it by three, right? You would add all three numbers and divide it by three. That's assuming if you're taking away the objects at the same time. If you're taking uh, each object one by one, then the math works out a little bit differently. Any questions about this before I move on? Any questions, please raise your hand. Anything you don't understand? 
Let me know. Okay. Anyway, guys, uh, make sure you submit the go forward tip after you are done. Guys, we're gonna watch a review video like always. Now this video is, again, it's a summarization. Also, one thing I realized is that when I talk, I think I was, I was watching my own recording one time just to check how bad the like recording quality was. And some, a student asked me a question in this class and the way I responded, I thought I was being an asshole when I was, when I responded to this student's question. So if you guys think that like, I, I, I'm, I like either I'm condescending or rude when I'm responding to your questions, just let me know. I didn't realize I sounded that way. I don't mean to. If I sound like I'm rude or condescending, please let me know. But I don't mean to sound that way. It's just something I noticed when I was like watching my own recording. Anyway, watch this video. static electricity you're probably thinking of sliding across a rug in your socks and getting a shock when you touch metal or clothes that stick together in a dryer static electricity is the accumulation of electric charge on the surface of or within a material the shock happens when the extra electrons move and are released or discharged from an object say from your finger to the light switch the charge doesn't have to be moving it's still there even when it's resting on an object one example of electrostatic force that you might not expect is car painting. When these robots paint cars, they use an electrostatic sprayer, which makes the paint go on very smoothly and evenly. How does static electricity help make that happen? The special paint sprayer charges the paint particles with extra electrons, giving them a negative charge. The surface of the car is positively charged. So when the negatively charged paint droplets are pushed through the sprayer, they are attracted to the car's positively charged surface. As long as the nozzle is close to the car and there isn't anything else around it that would attract the paint, it works really well. Less wasted paint and drips. Workers wear lint-free clothing so they don't attract the paint instead of the car. So let's look at this whole electrostatic process more thoroughly. Charge is a basic property of matter, like mass. Just like all matter weighs something, so all matter has a charge, which can be positive, negative, or neutral. At the atomic level, protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative one. The charges on a proton and electron are equal in magnitude and opposite in sign. Yeah, this should not be news to you guys. We, we talked about this, this should not be new. They balance one another out, both having a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. When an object's charges all balance out, that object is said to be neutral. The Earth is an example of a neutral object. Every charge creates a field around it, which we call an electric field. Other charges in the field will feel a pull if the charges are opposite, and a push if the charges are the same. Now, there are some rules about how charges move. Metal, like in cars, is one of the better conductors of electricity. A conductor is a material electrons can easily travel across. An insulator, like a car's tires, is a material that resists the movement of charge. It might seem like uh, counterintuitive, but a lot of people think that water is like, when they think of conducting electricity, they think of like water. Water is not actually a very good conductor of electricity. Metals are. Metals are one of the best conductors of electricity. So that, that's just one like tidbit, right? Because most people think that water is like really good at conducting electricity, but it's not. But like, but like, what if you have a pool of water and like an electric well, There is plenty of water, water. yeah. Like... I'm, even though it isn't like the best, it still conducts electricity. It's just not the best at it. Every material lets charge move to some extent. We just call them conductors or insulators depending on where on the spectrum they fall. 
Even if objects start out neutral, there are several ways we can give them a negative or positive charge. Let's try some experiments to show you how it's done. I have an uncharged balloon hanging by an insulator. One thing I want you guys to realize is that uh, whoever animated this didn't really, I don't made a mistake. Protons do not move. Just keep that in mind, please. It is very misleading. Protons do not move. Thread, a glass rod, and some fur. Let's look at charging by friction first. Let me prove to you this glass rod is uncharged. I'll bring it close to the balloon without touching. And see, the balloon is neither attracted or repelled. So right now, the rod has no net charge. Now, if I rub the fur on the glass rod, and then bring the rod near the balloon, see what happens? The balloon is pulled toward the rod. So when I hold the rod close to the balloon, ooh, that was a good one, the balloon is polarized and attracted to the rod. Proof that we really have given the rod a net charge, just using friction. There is a list of- Neither do electrons move that well in balloons. I don't know what this experiment was about, I think, it was, I think the balloon was initially electrically charged, negatively charged. And they brought a positive rod near that balloon. And so it attracted. But generally, the electrons don't move that well on a balloon. And the protons definitely do not move. Unless the atoms themselves move. I mean, which I guess you can argue because the balloon is moving but not in that way. Materials called the triboelectric series that ranks materials on how easily- I don't care about this. That means when- Don't care about this. Friction, friction, where we transfer charge by direct contact. This is an electroscope, a device that shows how charge accumulates. It has a metal sphere on the top connected to two metal foil leaves at the bottom by a metal rod. The leaves will either repel each other or attract, depending on the charge they are given. Right now, it's neutral. So the leaves are straight down, not attracting or repelling each other. But when I rub this glass rod with a piece of fur, I give it a positive charge and the electrons move from the rod to the fur. When I touch the rod to the top of the metal sphere on the top of the electroscope, electrons move from the electroscope to the rod, making the foil leaves at the bottom both positively charged. And yeah, I don't care about this one. A positive charge. Object you don't is care about induction. By bringing a charged object close to, but not touching the object. I'm gonna rub the rod with the fur again, giving the glass a positive charge, and the fur will gain electrons, giving it a negative charge. When I hold the rod up to the electroscope this time, just bringing it close enough, but not touching, it causes the positive charges in the electroscope to be repelled and to accumulate in the foil leaves. Now I'm gonna ground the electroscope by touching it with my hand while the rod is still close. This stops the leaves from Retains okay, its, okay. It's like smoke. When I remove the rod, the electroscope retains its positive charge without the charging object ever touching it. We humans have figured out how to use induction as well to help improve our environment. What looks like smoke coming from a smokestack is actually an aerosol, which are droplets suspended in the air. This is serious pollution. But many industrial plants today have gigantic electrostatic machines called precipitators that first charge the dirt particles negatively and then capture them on a positively charged plate where they can't escape into the air. That's induction. Precipitators can capture up to a large percentage of the particles from the burning material, though some pollution does escape. We use electrostatic charges for other things in our daily lives, like photocopiers. Here's how that works. The copier drum is positively charged. Through the use of a light source and lens, an image is formed on the charged surface. The surface containing the image is covered with negatively charged toner powder, which sticks only to the imaged area. A piece of paper, which has been given a charge, rolls over this area. Toner then sticks to the paper, which is then heated to make it stay in place. No matter how the objects are charged, whether by friction, conduction, or induction, like other forces, the electrostatic force is conservative. That means, like matter, it cannot be created or destroyed. That seems to be a common theme in the universe. In the case of electricity, it's called the law of conservation of charge, where electric charge cannot be created or destroyed, 
but can be transferred from one object to another. That means if I rub the rod with fur and the rod gains positive two microcoulombs of charge, the fur must now have a negative two microcoulomb charge. The charge the rod gains cannot be created out of nothing, and the charge the rod has lost can't just disappear. It is transferred to the fur. Second, charge only comes in certain amounts, which we call quantize. That means something can only be charged in multiples of the same value. In this case, the amount of charge we find on a single electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So let's recap what we've learned. Yeah, what they just said, like charge is not quantized, charge is quantized. Again, you cannot have half of an electron. I, I talked about this like two weeks ago. You can only have multiples of this number. You can only have multiples of an electron. You cannot have part of an electron. You cannot have half of an electron. You cannot have 2.5 electrons. Uh, your homework is due today. It's very much like the what, what you learned. Uh, have a good day, guys. See you guys tomorrow.